uh, France against Spain, second half. Bam! Block. <laughs> we can head over to, to the number one, the king of the king's position. If you guys, the two of you, would have to give the MVP award of this round to, to one player, who would it be? Ball across to Dylan Nahi, double in flight! Oh, what a start! Yeah, into the net. She does it again! Yes! On the shot! And it's time to talk handball again. Back at it. It's the three of us. It's the Danish-German, Danish connection this time. And uh, myself, Ben Kunko, I am calling from Germany. But uh, together with me, Mr. Once for Denmark, always Denmark, Martin Wilstrup. And on the other side, uh, Mr. 69 trophies and everything you ever dreamt about. Victor Tomas, nice to see you, boys. <laughs> hello, hello. Nice, nice to, to see, see you. you as well. <laughs> But I'm a All little bit disappointed ever... because just before we went live, what happened to your sweater, Captain America sweater here, being the yeah, I... <laughs> It was not allowed to have it on. <laughs> it's just a little bit too warm for that in the studio, but it, it is my ugly oh, okay. Christmas sweater. Uh, and I do have a lot of them, actually, but uh, I totally love it. And uh, it's the 2nd of December when we're recording, so it's Saturday. And it's definitely uh, become time to wear those Christmas sweaters. So uh, I'm rocking them all along right now. I, I, I'm just uh, worried about I'm, I'm uh, something that you have ever. How, how was the presentation now? Because it was, it was quite crazy. Mr. All 69 ever... trophies and everything you ever dreamt about. <laughs> okay. Because okay. Uh... Yeah, I, I actually like it. Yeah, once uh, you get the big guns out, everybody in the room gets silent. <laughs> uh, it was funny. How much it was th funny chat between the between each other yesterday in our private WhatsApp group. Huh? Yeah, uh, <laughs> one could say it in that direction, but it's great because uh, we did discuss about uh, our topic for the day, and then uh, you were just being like, "I'm not going to drop the topic yet," um, but then you were just like, "Well, oh, I'm the best ever," and then you just post a picture <laughs> of yourself in between all your trophies, and yeah. uh, I was a little bit intimidated. I'm honest. <laughs> well. Uh... Uh, I was joking, you know. I was uh, I was joking, but actually, it's a picture I I love because it's very visual, and it's a picture. It's very typical from all the uh, FC Barcelona uh, players that have had some history uh, at the club. Uh, when they retire, they have the picture with all the the trophies uh, they have win with the club, and it's really visual and it's something I love. I have the same picture with all my family, of course. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. But uh, I can, I can understand. Uh, how often do you still look at that picture, and do you have it printed out, hanging in your in your apartment somewhere? The club actually they gave it to me as a gift, mm -hmm. and it's uh, yeah, it's in my it's in my uh, ho home somewhere. I'm not gonna say where, but uh, it's in my home. <laughs> <laughs> we probably don't even want to know where it hangs, uh, but it's uh, it's uh, totally fine and uh, very yeah. majestic. I can really just uh, say very majestic. And uh, from that side, just congratulations once again uh, for everything that you achieved thank in your you. career, because uh, that is just huge. Uh, let's let's be honest. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, Which one I'm of looking you? at that. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. No, no, looking at that picture. It feels like, like uh, everything everything so fast, you know, because now I think like, okay, did I have the time to do all this? Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's quite impressive. Yeah, most definitely is. Um, which one of your trophies is the most meaningful to you? Uh, Probably the Champions League trophy uh, that I had the chance to rise as a captain in 2015. Yeah. Uh, because for, for me as a Barca fan, since I was a kid and, and a, a Barca member, uh, supporter. So I, you know, I, I, I grew up with Barca around me. I grew up going to Palau Blagrana, watching Barca, supporting for Barca. So to raise uh, such important champ or my club uh as a captain was uh, an amazing feeling yes 
Yeah, I could uh, totally imagine. Martin, if you would have to choose one trophy that you would be able to lift because you won it, which one would it be? I'm actually, uh, I have to say it's a beautiful picture. I'm only disappointed that I didn't have any comeback when uh, Victor posted. It was like, you know, the <laughs> mic drop. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> well, there is, yeah. nothing, there is nothing that you can say to that. There is, uh, so, uh, especially no. since uh, you're always complaining that uh, I shall not introduce you uh, after Victor. Uh, well, that is one of the reasons. Now you know why. <laughs> Yeah. Now you know why, but I have to say it's actually unbelievable how many trophies there are on this on the picture. Uh, if I have to name one, well, the European Championship for me personally, um, yeah, that has to be, uh, yeah, I think that's the one. That's the one, yeah. Why is that? But uh, I wish I was capable of just having a. Uh, two percent of the trophies that victor have won uh, <laughs> in indo because i don't know how many trophies there were but it's like uh, 50 or something 60 or i don't know how many there were it's it's 69. <laughs> 60, <okay. Yeah. laughs> weird flex actually in the picture you cannot count 69 because it's some trophies that they give you the physical trophy when you win three of them ah but all right hey but it's 69 trophies on my CV with the FC Barcelona. Almost too many to fit into one picture. That says it all. <laughs> Actually, Stop insane. talking about me. But, Enough yeah. about that. Enough about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. Uh, but uh, since you you started the talk about my about my ugly Christmas weather, I was wondering in my question of the week, which one is the worst Christmas song for you guys? The worst. Ooh. Ooh. That's a tricky question. Yeah. I don't know many. I don't know many Christmas songs, actually. But uh, it's a tricky question. And Ooh. yeah, that I don't know. Then I only actually know the, the ones that you probably want to listen to at Christmas evening. And then otherwise, you know, last Christmas, you know... But a true classic. Um, you, you, you can't miss out on last yeah. Christmas. I know. Yeah, but which one is the worst for you, Ben? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering about that as well. Um, but I think I would go down with uh, Mariah Carey, actually. Uh, all no, I want for Christmas. All I want is you. for Christmas. Yeah, no. actually, actually, because no. uh, it, it's just. Uh, what? The first three times that you listen to it, it's really catchy and uh, you really like it. But the first three times that you listen to it, it's like mid of October. And then uh, each and every day, uh, all day and all night, it uh, goes through all the radio stations and uh, every, yeah, well, every uh, every grocery store, whatever. And uh, you just can't miss out on that song. And it just, it loses its vibe after hearing it for the 37th time in two days. And uh, that's why at the minute... I would say uh, all I want for Christmas is you. <laughs> <laughs> to me, okay. it's like, I don't know why I'm saying this actually, but like 20 years ago, um, this song, it was more like whenever you heard it and I had a crush on a girl and I, I kept thinking about her <laughs> because all I wanted for Christmas was <laughs> she, <laughs> and I thought it was a good idea, but uh, it never turned out. It was uh, the wrong way to do it. But um, yeah. <laughs> Now you have to open it up. Try. Who was it? Who oh. was your crush? <laughs> <laughs> you are you are a legend. You are a legend, Martin. I love I love this story. But at least I gave it a try. You know, you know that one checked <laughs> didn't work. Then I have to go to another one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So don't do that, guys. Don't do it. Otherwise, <laughs> I actually find the uh, the lyrics quite uh, catchy. But um, I don't know wh know which one is the worst. So um, I don't listen to Christmas songs that much. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Victor, how about you? Can you name one or? No, I don't think so. Because actually, the ones that I have in my mind now, I like them. You know. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Driving home for Christmas, let it snow. It's beginning to look Ooh. a lot. You know. Yeah. So uh, oh, I can see you as a Michael Bublé <laughs> listener. Uh, definitely, that uh, that suits you. Uh, but actually, how does it feel for you? Because uh, I introduced it, uh, us today as the German Danish Danish connection. Um, because uh, you are actually in Denmark right now, aren't you freezing yeah. to death? Uh, actually, I like the cold. 
I like the cold. Uh, yes, I'm in Denmark. I'm in Frederikshaven uh, watching the Women uh, World Championship. And actually, I like the cold and I love to come here to, to walk on the streets full of snow. But of course, uh, I love it because I have two, three days of that and I go back to Spain and it's uh, <laughs> sunny, 15 degrees, you know, so. Oh, poor you. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but actually, I like it. How cool is but it? Have you noticed, Paint, that uh, in the background of Victor, he still brought his paddle and uh, gear with him uh, to, oh, actually, to yeah. keep it up, to keep in training? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he shall not get out of shape for uh, oh. for our uh, paddle match. That is true. Good eyes, Martin. I didn't notice that. I, I, I'm always prepared, you know. You never know when a good paddle game is coming. <laughs> yeah, well, and uh, you did ask in that private WhatsApp group whether Martin lives far away from from Frederikshaven, so uh, that might have been the first uh, the first preparation. But uh, it's almost across the country, isn't it, Martin? Well, when when it comes to Danish culture, I would say that driving two hours is a lot. But uh, I'm probably when you're coming from another country, it is. But you know, driving two hours to beat uh, Victor's ass in a in a paddle game is not that far away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. you have to be careful what I say now on, because on, you on might this, end up have this. seventy trophies after this one, <laughs> <laughs> and that will be on, the biggest one. On this bed that we have, all the three of us. We need a camera person. Yeah, probably. To record to record <laughs> some of that. And when the game is over and in the next episode of the podcast, we should show some images. <laughs> yeah, it's uh it is a good idea, but uh, the question is for who of us because uh, one of the three of us will be devastated after the match. I'm uh, pretty sure about that. <laughs> uh uh, it's going to be a legendary uh, um, on the internet when you see paint fails and all the missed shots you will have paint. <laughs> <laughs> You're underestimating my, my sports capabilities. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing that. But that's totally fine. Um, we want to talk today about uh, people whose uh, sporty skills are absolutely not to be underestimated because uh, we're talking about the king's position and i'm actually super keen to hear what you guys are are saying because uh, we were looking for a topic today and then uh, when you talk about the best players of all time it's uh, already quite difficult but to narrow it down we just focused on one position and we want to know who is the best left back of all time and uh, martin has his little little paper prepared and i'm uh, very interested in uh, what will stand on that paper in the end um, but maybe to start it off victor is your choice for the top left back of all time did you share the stage with him yes yes i shared the stage with him yes uh i i, I have i have one name which for me is the best in 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 the history but i have a couple more names uh that probably you also have in your mind mm -hmm. uh to, to 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 just maybe you know implement a little bit more the, the 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 position but i think that the one i have in my mind has also crossed your minds as well and probably is the one that martin has uh write it down in the <laughs> in the paper oh then uh, i'm uh, i'm interested well that that uh, is intriguing what makes a, a left back unique? What does a left back have to do uh, on the on the court that uh, makes him more important for the game than other posi positions, Martin? Hmm. Well, first of all, I have to say if I understood the assignment correctly, I have to choose the best left back that I think, maybe not of all time, but my favorite left back um or yeah of all time so probably he's not the best in somebody else's mind but uh i know the player that victor is talking about and uh last time when we had to pick the player that we liked the most we picked the same one or he picked the mm so i have to also think out of the box uh, and who was who was i looking up to when i was younger but uh, a great left back uh to me he has to be um First of all, if he's not great in both ends, you know, being capable of covering number two or number three in defense, then he has to, first of all, have a great shot, a power in the one versus one, uh, clever, 
you know, the overview of the field. And also to me, the best players have a tendency to show up whenever the games has to be decided and they are not afraid to, you know, to take the chance. Sometimes they fail, but most often they succeed. And uh, yeah, that's to me uh, the king position, if we can call it that, that they are they're showing up whenever it's needed and uh, then it's of course individual what you like the most if you like people who is capable of shooting from 16 meters or you like the the powerhouses who can go one versus one or great at playing the line player or the wings uh, so uh, yeah it's interesting to hear what what we have chosen uh, but i've gone i've written down some names that i looked up to and that i think uh, you know ha- had a, m- a massive impact internationally um yeah, there are probably one that we already had as as a guest um, that sh- is the best of the history. Um, but um, yeah, I also, because probably Victor would say that name, so I had to think of other names as well. Victor, what, uh, what do you think? Do you have something to, to add on that? I completely agree with uh, with Martin. I, I think that... Uh, uh, left back most of the times is the player who has uh, uh, yeah, all the back players, but the left back is always seen as a player that has to be good, especially in the handball, how we understand handball nowadays, uh, because back in the past, it was really different. It was a lot of players who were not playing in defense. Their rhythm was uh, so low. So they had a lot of time to change and nothing nothing was happening because the teams were not running the way they are running today. Uh, so I think that the left back is is a player that everybody's looking up to when the when the clunch time is coming. And yeah, I agree hundred percent with everything that Martin said. Yeah, totally. And uh, that's why. Uh, well, actually. Is there is there a Spanish name for for a left back as well? So uh, I just called it, and Martin said it as well. The king's position, because that's what you called it in German. Uh, do you have that a name like that in Spanish? No, as well? no, no. It's not like a nickname to define the the left back position. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. But to me, it can also, uh, if I had to add another skill, it could also be the leader type that are capable of maybe not always being the top scorer on the field, but also showing his teammates in which direction they need to go. And, you know, just being there as a team player for them, obviously he has to play a key role in the team, but otherwise just being a leader as well is to me also what makes people greater than probably someone else. Yeah. Um, have you guys got three names? Because uh, I think Victor narrowed uh, his uh, choice down to to three names. Martin, have you got three names as well? Yeah, I actually written down five, uh, but you told me only to have three. And uh, to should I start it off with saying my name? Uh, some of the names now. Or... Uh, j- just go ahead with the with the lower two then. So the the one that didn't make it into the top three. Okay, the one. The, okay, if I had to pick two that didn't make it into my top three, then I actually looked at um, Philip Yisha. I find uh, Philip Yisha a very nice, a great player. You know, he could shoot from distance. He was a leader for the Czech Republic, his club team, and just a goal sh- scoring machine. Uh, he didn't make it into my top uh, top top three. And then actually, I went with a guy that I looked up to. He's probably not um the best in the history uh if you look at titles clubs or but i think he had a great career as well and, and uh, victor probably played with him i actually liked when i was younger Iga romero mm-hmm. um and i liked him because uh i don't think he probably was the most talented player but uh he was a character and uh, he was capable of shooting uh yeah some weird shots and he also changed club to germany out of nowhere we kind of looked and why why are you changing to Germany now? But in general, he didn't make it into my top three either, but that was a guy I had in mind because he was a character when I was younger and he was just like, he's just shooting some weird shots and they ended up scoring. And uh, Victor knows it more than me, but yeah. And he was probably also a character out of the field that I don't know, but uh, yeah, those are the two that um, didn't make it, uh, but there were, I've written them now. But I mean, that's something that Victor can uh, tell us something about about uh, his character apart from from the apart from the game. Uh, Iker, he's a uh, he's an amazing guy. He's an amazing guy outside of the of the playing court. It's a 
a funny guy, a guy that, that is very easy to to speak with, and you're all, you're always uh, making jokes with him. And yeah, it's a it's a really funny guy. But yeah, he was a big character, and uh, I, I, in his time in Barcelona, uh, especially uh, in two thousand five. Yeah, from 2005 until 2011, uh, you know, his role in, in the team was super and, and he had uh, a lot of character and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, he had some problems in controlling his temper. Uh, <laughs> so so this uh, made him to have a, a, a two, one or two problems with, uh, with people. Uh, but it was a person that afterwards it was very easy to go to him and speak with him and he was uh, saying sorry if he thought he was wrong or then he was discussing with you if he didn't think uh, he was wrong. Yeah, uh, that is fair. Uh, but did uh, any of those two names, Philip Bicher or Ica Romero, make it to your top three, Victor? Yeah, actually, uh, Philip Bicher make it to my top three. Mm -hmm. uh, it's number three, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say a lot of names that uh, are uh, right there in the number four, you know, uh, very close mm -hmm. to make it to the number three. I would say Ike Romero. I would say also Alberto Entre Rios. Mm -hmm. I would say Momirilic. Mm -hmm. I would say Carlos Reinaldo Perez. Uh, I even would say Baselin Bujovic. Uh, so... Yeah, I I could say a lot, a lot of names. Uh, I would say also Mikkel Hansen. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot of players that uh, are right there, very, very close to make it to the top three. Oh, then uh, actually I'm super interested in uh, who uh, then made it into your top three because uh, some of the names that you just said, they do appear in my in my top three. Um, yeah, of course. Of course, Mikkel Hansen is uh, a big, big name in the last 15 years in, in Hamburg. Yeah. But the reason for me that he's not making it to the top three is because he's not a important player in the defensive end. Mm -hmm. for any of the teams that he played with uh, so that's why but of course it's a player that I would love to have in my team because yeah. it's a player who can win a lot of uh, not only games who can win tournaments for you only in the attack position because he's a genius but then uh, you you did play together with him didn't you mm -hmm. yes I played together with him you have uh, good memories with him on the court yeah, on the court, yes, not that many actually, because he he didn't play that much during his time in Barcelona with Manolo Cadenas for one season, and in the second season he was with uh, with Xavi Pascual, mm -hmm. and he did not have this role after leaving Barcelona that he had in in Copenhagen. Uh, I have better memories with him outside of the playing court. <laughs> <laughs> and i will i will keep them for me ah that's too bad that's too bad uh, but uh, understandable um yeah but uh, i'll just uh, open up that i do have Mikkel hansen in my top three and he was very close to make it to the top one actually uh because i just uh, find it insane that uh, what he achieved for Denmark uh, in my opinion he put Denmark on the map because uh, he really initialized all that Danish uh, yeah the Danish glow up throughout the the last years and one was one of those shining faces when they just won back to back to back world championship when they won the gold medal in 2016 um, just to remember back to Beijing 2008 when they were just about to get kicked out of the out of the group stage and it was the the last shot and Mikkel Hansen was 20 years old and the the coach gave him that last shot he uh, had an, uh, an Eduard Kokharov uh, ahead of him and he just managed to score that free shot in the very last second at just 20 years of age. That man has just ice in his veins and I'm super impressed by that and uh, just the way that he yeah, led Denmark throughout the last uh, 15 years uh, to maybe the best team in the world still right now. Uh, it is just uh, incomparable for me.
Well, uh, if we have to comment on it, it's hard to discuss about Mikkel Hansen making it to top three. I, I, I think Victor has a point with the defensively yeah. uh, skills. Um, it's probably not always on top, and you always, on, sometimes on the national team, also see that he's covering the left wing because uh, Manos Landin is capable of standing as uh, left back in the defense, and uh, that can also be a tactical um, yeah, input from the coach because you want to give him some breaks. Um, at the mo- at the moment, he's also himself comment that he's benefiting from having two fast guys uh, on his left and right side, and that's Pütlik and, and Gitzel, so he can just give them the ball and they will do something, and then he can benefit from his shot. But Without a doubt, Mick Hansel is one of the biggest also, if you ask me. He didn't make it to my top three either. Um, oh. um, because, uh, yeah, maybe I misunderstood it, as I said it. But uh, to, I also made a list of the people that I actually looked up to and was my favorite players. So probably not the biggest of the history, <laughs> but they're my uh, yeah role models. Well, I'm uh, interested in how you understood the assignment then, because I'm just going to read out loud the uh, the message that I, I really texted into the group. I like the idea of the best left back of all time, the king's position. Uh, Will be a little harder, but we'll take it. Uh, It will be a personal one, uh, but let's discuss our favorites. Yeah, all right. With uh, our favorites at the end. Personal one, and to me, they are the best. So that's why I chose them. But uh, yeah, without spoiling anything, uh, I can, uh, of course, say that the one that probably is number one at Victor, he is. Yeah, the GOAT, as we introduced him earlier, and there's no <laughs> doubt that he should be number one on everyone's list. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I had to think out of the box, and uh, maybe I find it a little bit boring if we all say this, the same answer as number one. So I tried to think a little bit different. Yeah. I, I Just to just to add something about Mikkel Hansen and, and, and maybe move on to the number two on, on our lists. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that, one of the biggest strength of Mikkel and one of the biggest skills of Mikkel is that we all know that he can pass to the pivot. We all know that he can score from 10, 11, 12 meters. He can shoot from uh, a lot of different uh, places. Uh, but for me, one of the better things of Mikkel is his uh, choices, the choices he makes during the game. He is a player that he could shoot much more uh, than he does but he is not a selfish player. He is making her teammates play from the left back position, which is very, very difficult. And and for me, uh, it's something that he always uh, had, but now uh, that he is getting older, you know, uh, 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 as a player for a player age, let's say, uh, for me, his best skill is that he is always taking good choices. You know, yeah. good decisions, and yeah, and for fair. me, this is something that makes him even even better. His his passing skills are unbelievable. I have to say, also playing, you know, one man up, uh, his passes to the wings, and also the speed he puts in his passes. They, it's just unbelievable, and you can see the technique where whenever he passes the ball is yeah. That's impressive, I have to say. And if you want to learn something, maybe you should take a look at some Mikkel Hansen YouTube clip, and then <laughs> there you definitely have something to uh, to practice. Yeah, especially because it's so versatile. Uh, he just combines it all: uh, strength and shot power. He has a very flexible wrist, and uh, it's just, yeah, uh, I I really like the winner's mentality that you uh, get just from his aura, and uh, that's why he ended up being my my number two in the end. But uh, before we come to your guys' number twos, I uh, need to hear about your third spots. Martin, you may start. Uh, my first spot is actually one that Victor already mentioned, and I smiled a little bit when you said him. But to me, uh, he was an unbelievable player, and also. Uh, I like the style whenever he was shooting uh, penalties, uh, the way that he did it. And uh, I remember myself when I was younger, I looked at him and tried to copy the way that he did it. But uh, I can fairly say that he did it more su- more successfully than I uh, I did. That's actually Mumia Illich. Uh, I like Mumia Illich as a player and the playing style and also think he had a great career. Um, maybe it could have been even bigger with the national team if you, yeah, he couldn't, he cannot change where he's from but you know serbia is one of the countries when it comes to they are decent they're a pretty good team but uh, on top level uh, there are, have been other national teams that are better but he played in kiel and Vesprem. so yeah to me to me Mumia Ilic made it uh, into my uh, to my list as number three 
Yeah, and I mean, uh, <laughs> he does have a a fairly good career uh, laying behind him. Uh, Champions League winner twice with Kiel. Um, he. Uh, he could have won another Champions League title, but it was actually Victor Tomas Barcelona that uh, denied that next uh, Champions League title from him in 2016 when he played for for West Brom. Uh, Victor, what uh, what pops up when you think about that final? It was 2015, I think. Yeah, it was 15. Was it? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, it was. Uh, it was a tough game, I think, uh, along with another teams. But maybe we were probably the both uh, favorites for the for the competition. And but I think that this season for us was amazing. We uh, we could we won seven titles out of seven during the season, and we only lost one game at uh, at away against Bisla Plok in Poland. Uh, but the rest of the games we 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 won all all of them. So uh, that final was amazing because, uh, as I said, I was the captain uh, and and I could raise the the trophy. And I think that the whole team was really really focused about winning because the previous year we lost the semi final against Flensburg in the penalties, and that that hard that that was really hard. Yeah, understand. So all the team was really, really focused on on that season. Yeah, understandable. Um, but then, how was it to to play against Momir Ilic, um, especially in in that game? Because that season he did become the the top scorer of the the EHF Champions League men with one hundred and fourteen goals actually. So, uh, well, once you put those numbers up, you do want to win that. Yeah, he was a player that uh, he, uh, especially when he was playing with with Chema, this Spanish playmaker Chema Rodriguez, uh, uh, they had uh, they had uh, a lot of uh, connections, you know, and and a lot of things that uh, when Pasqui was studying him, uh, we could know uh, where he was going, but at the end of the day, he was shooting and he was scoring, so it was. It was uh, difficult to to defend uh, to defend him because he used different tempos also of shooting. Sometimes he was shooting fast or he was jumping and 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 holding his position in the air and then shooting. And I think that most importantly than where the ball is going, of course, this is important. Where the ball is going is when you are throwing the ball, because uh, if the goalkeepers and the defenders, if they don't know when. Uh, it's it's more difficult for them. Yeah. Um, but then I am surprised. What will be your number three? My number three? Mm-hmm. Yeah, was it, was Philippe, Philippe, right? it was Philippe Gicca. Ah, Philippe Gicca, yes. yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think we cannot, we cannot have this discussion about uh, left backs and not say the name I'm going to say now. Maybe, well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait uh, to All see right. if some of you... <laughs> Of if some of you say say that name because okay. uh, it's a big mm. name. My third uh, my third spot is still missing. Uh, that's why I'm just gonna go ahead and maybe guess into the blue that uh, your uh, the one that you are talking about is Yarhe Ruchenka, uh, one of the best left backs mm. of all time. Um, especially if you just uh, look at that career for for how many clubs he has played and uh, how, for how many clubs he has played very well. Um, and I really like one fact about him. Between 2006 and 2015, he won almost each and every time the, the Spanish League. So uh, it was just in 2010 when he uh, didn't win the Spanish League. But uh, at first it was for Ciudad Real. Um, and then later on uh, he uh, went to uh, the Barcelona side of Victor Tomas. What else could it be? Um, and then just kept on winning and winning and winning and winning. Um, and yeah, he is in a very, very exclusive club of players to win the Champions League title with three different clubs. Um, and that just shows uh, how massive of a player he was. I like the choice, but you can also choose him as best line player, maybe, because he could yeah. play everything. He could also play right back. And yeah, he was an uh, unbelievable player. Uh, a different type of player, I would say, also. But you know that more, Victor. But uh, yeah, he was definitely... Uh, entertaining to look to watch <laughs> uh, 
That was a very elegant way to put it, eh, Martin? <laughs> yeah, he was an amazing player. He was a player that he was always there when the team needed him. Uh, sometimes he he lost his temper and he made some stupid things uh, and, and get two minutes or something like that. But it was a it yeah, it was a player that it was never hiding from from anything. You know, when we were traveling to the to the warmer, let's say, arenas, he was always there and he was a very heavy player, you know. He was not the strongest one. He was not the fastest one or uh, the, 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 with the, with the fast, faster shoot. But he was a very heavy player to defend. It was very difficult to defend him because he could go to the strong side, to the weak side. He could shoot here in your, in your head, you know, very, uh, very fast. And also jumping and shooting. And it was a player that I had a very, very good connection with uh, in Barcelona when we were running the fast break. And I was going in all the time, and then he was starting from his side. It was a it was amazing player and a player that he always wanted to win. He didn't care about if he was playing in the in the left back or in the line player or in the line as a line player. He always wanted to win. And to me, I also remember him as a person that went on for 60 minutes. So, you know, he was just going full power. So even whenever he looked so tired after 50 minutes, he would still took the ball and try to go one versus one and got a penalty or whatever. But uh, interesting choice. I like it. Uh, he was definitely a great player. And is that the missing name that you look for, uh, Victor? Or, uh, oh, well, then uh, <laughs> give us your second spot. Okay, my second spot. Uh, is a player who played as a left back uh, some time of his career and the other time of his career when my number one was playing with him he played as a playmaker uh, it's uh, Stefan Lovgren mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah that's a yeah. good one it's a but Stefan it's, Lovgren. to me it's also you know uh, do we see the players as the king left back or could they also play the playmaker position? Because uh, you could also say that about your number one, probably, but uh, <laughs> because yeah. he's so good, he can play everything, you know, but yeah, uh, even, uh, you know, in the lower teams here in Denmark, even on my team, we have a, you know, in, in offense, when we have to do something, we call it a Lufgren. So, uh, you know, you have been a really great player whenever you have something you, you're named after you. So we just call it there and then people knows what to do. Yeah, I think he was amazing, you know, in the late 90s uh, with the Sweden national team and then yeah. uh, with Kiel, everything he has he have done. Uh, because also for me, Jiha, for example, is not higher on this list because of the national team. You know, because for me, yeah. uh, it's a players that they have to have, they need to have an impact uh, in their teams, but also to be the best in history of all time. You need to have some uh, amazing CV, not only with your, uh, with your team, also with your national team. So I think that Stefan Logren and the Swedish national team, they were the best in their er era. The only thing it's missing for them is the gold medal in the Olympic Games, which uh, Russia was uh, beating them. Uh, but I think that Stefan Lovgren, he had a big, big impact in the modern humble. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, but I do feel like Martin's second spot would have uh, a big impact on modern handball as well. Well, actually, I totally agree what uh, Victor just said with the national team, but uh, <laughs> then my second choice is super controversial because uh, mine didn't win anything with the national team. Uh, I just like the playing style he did. And um, he even, if I have to name, uh, he only played for Ciudad Real that I would categorize as being some of the best teams <laughs> in the world. Otherwise, he played in Denmark. Um, and um, ah, Okay. Yeah, then he played in Denmark and it was just to me because he was um, in some way he was so uh, elegant and the way that he was capable of shooting and he could do it like, you know, sometimes he did the kind of goals that end up on the internet because, you know, the underarm shot or some, I actually choose one and it's very controversial. I know that now after what Victor just said, I actually chose uh, Christian Schelling 
um, as my number two. But that's my personal choice. I know he's not the <laughs> best left back when it comes to CV and in the history. Then I would actually choose another one. But um, to me personally, I like the style that he played the way that he did it. But um, yeah, he was also not a powerhouse in the defense and uh, maybe not, you know, it's not going to go down in history with trophies as well. But um, I just like, he's not the biggest when it comes to trophies and stuff like that. I have to be honest about that. I have to say, Christian Schelling, when he came to Spain to, to Ademar Leon, I think as long as I remember, it's the biggest impact we have had in the Spanish league ever because nobody knew him and the way he played, uh, he came and he scored uh, 10 goals again against Portland San Antonio. He scored 10 goals against Ciudad Real. He scored 10 goals against Barcelona. Then they went to play the Spanish Cup in, in Torrevieja and he scored 13 goals in the final uh, and they win. Uh, they were the underdogs, you know? So I think Christian yeah. Schelling was the biggest impact that the Spanish league has ever had because uh, nobody knew him, you know? And the way he was playing, oh, it was uh, amazing to see when he arrived to, to Spain. And that's what I remember, you know, not uh, as good as you, but I'm glad that you actually backed me up here a little bit, Vito, because as I said, when it comes to trophies and national team, he's not up there with the biggest one, but just he, he made it look uh, something that's really difficult. Sometimes it looks a little bit easy, actually, and he, he could score a lot of goals. And he was also affected a little bit by injuries, and maybe that would have made his career a little bit better. Uh, bigger as it was but uh, yeah to me he was when i looked at him he was like wow i wish i could do just some of those kind of stuff but uh, yeah that's my number two and it's gonna be debatable and controversial and i hope some people will probably disagree <laughs> with me because that's a funny thing about making a list yeah 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 absolutely yeah. but uh, i don't know I why i think i think the name that it's missing in my opinion it's your number one, Martin. Probably, probably. <laughs> oh, well, then uh, uh, just open up, uh, go grab your sheet and then uh, show us who your best uh, left back of all time in your personal favorite choices. In my personal just, opinion. Just ask me, just answer me this question. In your personal opinion, the best left back of all time, it's a teammate of the national team of my number one? Uh, yeah. Yeah, without yeah. without a doubt. Yeah, yeah it is. That's um, I have to, if I have to say, I, Victor can say his name, so I'm not going to spoil it. And uh, probably <laughs> the one who's listening know the one who we're talking about because we named him the GOAT. The one that I may, uh, if I have to say personally, uh, to me, the best and the one that I looked up to and he's left, right, left uh, against one versus one, where he just shifts his body to one side. Yeah, it's, it's Daniel Nassis, I have to say. And, uh, you know, I think he won the Olympic gold two times, uh, four times world champion, European championship three times. And that's only winning. And he played in Kiel and Paris and in, yeah, in, in Gummersbach as well. And um, he also probably won a lot of bronze and, and silver medals with the national team. But uh, yeah, to me, Daniel Nassis, uh, yeah, without a doubt, the best one versus one that you couldn't get. And he was unbelievable strong. I never played against him, so I don't know. But whenever you looked at him, and it's the same way with the... Uh, people will say, yeah, he will go to his right. But yeah, try to stop him anyway, because he's going to go to the left first. And if you're not there, then he's just going to go in that little space and narrow space he will jump into it and he could shoot he was a powerhouse in defense as well and he was a part of a french team that won everything like in everything so uh, yeah to me personally daniel nassis is the one that I, when i have to think about who i looked up to the most that was daniel nassis understandable very understandable and uh, he is a part of uh, some of the the biggest teams that went down in history. Uh, that that French side, uh, it uh, was most definitely a very very uh, interesting one to watch. A very frightful one to play against. Um, Victor, did you? Uh, what was the worst game that you played against France? Ah, uh, it's. It's so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Mm-hmm. I but think the worst so that I have. Yeah. yeah, I think the worst that I have the worst memory is the semi final in 2015 Qatar EHF World Championship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because we had, yeah, we had no chance. And also, I have a very bad memory about the quarterfinals in uh, Olympic Games in London. Uh, they beat mm-hmm. us with the last uh, second goal. Still controversial goal. Uh, so, yeah. But it's, I could say, more games. But uh, I would choose yes. those two. I have to say one thing. I have to say one thing. And maybe, maybe we could find the images. <laughs> I blocked I blocked one time, one ball to Daniel Narcis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In the group phase of the EHF Euro in Serbia. 2010, I think, no, or uh, 12, Uh, France against Spain, second half, bam, block. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I will always remember that. I was in defense, Victor. (laughs) Yes, yes, in number two, eh, Martin? (laughs) Yeah. uh, You've been in the wrong position your whole career. (laughs) <laughs> I, I have been I have been underused my whole career. It would have been seventy titles. It would have been seventy. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Martin? I can't understand. <laughs> no. It's funny because it's true, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Um, banked, banked, banked. Mm-hmm. Martin, he has said he's number one, and we don't know your number two. You do know my number two, uh, Mikkel Hansen. No. Mikkel Hansen, maybe. Yeah, ah, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we did talk about it, but uh, it's fine. True. I uh, did forget about your number three as well. So uh, we're even now. We're even. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, then uh, we can head over to, to the number one, the king of the king's position. You can, you have to call him like that because, uh, well, we introduced him into the podcast uh, that way. And uh, he is not just an amazing sportsman, but an even better human being as far as uh, I can... Uh, I can say that uh, you do know that a little better, a little lot better than I do, uh, Victor. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, I wasn't even too sure whether I should uh, take him into that ranking because right now he plays the center back position. But Nikola Karabatic is just uh, one of the best, if not the best, to ever enter the handball stage. And uh, on the left back position, he had a huge impact. It started off uh, very early in his career. Um, maybe one of the more remar- remarkable games in uh, his career was the the EHF Champions League final 2003, I guess it was, where they uh, turned around a 27 to 19 in the from the first leg to win by 11 in the second leg, and uh, he was a huge impact maker in that very match. So uh, yeah, Nikola Karabatic. It was written in the stars that uh, he was about to conquer the handball world uh, just at the moment when he set his foot onto the court. I think that probably, probably, if we would ask to 100 fans who is the best player in the world in history, maybe we could get 85% that are telling us Nikola Karabatic. And this is something really difficult to achieve. If we, yeah. if we, if we don't think about colors and teams and national teams, if, if we ask to people who likes handball and who knows about handball and don't hmm give a shit about uh, national teams or teams or colors or something. I think that out of 10, 85 would say Nikola Karabatic. And this is a really, really high percentage. And I think it's really difficult to achieve in a team sport like handball. Like, uh, uh, you know, when, when a lot of players have uh, impact in the game and, and especially Nico, who has played with so many good players around him, that also have made him uh, a better player and have helped him to achieve a lot of things. But uh, I think that what Nico have done during his career uh, is really, really uh, difficult. And to have so many people agreeing, uh, agree uh, about him being the best is so difficult. 
I would even say that that number might be higher than uh, 90, mm. uh, 85%. So uh, I would almost go with 95, 96% of the people who would instantly say Nikola Karabatic. There was one guy who didn't last year at the uh, Trucks Go 24 EHF Final Four when we asked him about the gold. He was like, DKMM, all the way. DKMM it is. And I was like, <laughs> okay, you say DKMM, then DKMM it is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, that, that was a good moment as well. Uh, but still, yeah, uh, his, his trophy speak for himself. And even if you do care about the colors and uh, if it's just for uh, for your team, you could still probably say Nikola Karabatic because he played everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, if I have to say something, uh, I would also, if I have to pick for the best of the all time, I also say Karabacic. But uh, in personal terms, as uh, you said it earlier, I think I have to choose as uh, mine role models but of course Karabacic I should have him as number one as well because he is the GOAT and the greatest of all time and he played in Kiel in Barcelona in Paris and in every club and those are probably the biggest clubs in the world and also Montpellier to be fair whenever he played for them as well there were also and still is a big club he had a massive impact in all of them in both ends and also in the national team and it's like you could always give him the ball And he would, he, I would say the same about him with the Nazis. People probably always knew that he was going to his right, but you couldn't stop him because he's too strong. And he was basically just some point, just it's too good. And uh, yeah, it's fair to say that Karabacic is, is the best that I've ever been, if you ask me as well. Yeah, and uh, he is on his last dance. Uh, we are enjoying the, the last Karabacic show. Um, And I think everyone is just enjoying that. Uh, that moment when he came back to Kiel for one last time, they honored him as well. And uh, it's just, uh, it's incredible uh, how much of a legacy that guy really built up throughout the the last centuries. Uh, well, not the last centuries, the last decades. That's what I wanted to say. Um, but yeah, uh, it's... Uh, Uh, Hempel has probably never seen anything like him and maybe won't ever see anything like him ever again. Uh, so, yeah, um, we are happy that we were still able to talk to him as a as the gigantic player that he is. Uh, if you guys haven't listened to it yet, then uh, go ahead and listen to our very first episode of The Spin We Talk Hempel. It was uh, a great talk with him. Um, But yeah, right now it doesn't even look too good for uh, the the Cinderella story for the miracle for for Paris <laughs> to win it for the first time. But but it says a lot. Also, I only knew him from the experience when we had him as a guest, a great guest. But even I, you know, I'm sympathizing and hoping that the Cinderella story goes well, and it, you know, it's just would be the perfect end of a. Yeah, I would say almost a perfect career um, for Nicolas Karabacic uh, to win it with yeah, a French club and Paris Saint-Germain. So uh, even though I, I said the West Prem is going to win it, if uh, I'm not going to, you know, put that one spot on, then I hope definitely that Karabacic could end it. And uh, yeah, it will be well deserved. But as you said, at the moment, they are struggling a little bit um, in, in, the, in the Champions League EHF. And I know whose fault it is. Because uh, uh, ever since Victor said uh, that they are the number three of the hot ranking, they didn't win shit. So uh, they basically, uh, of, uh, out of the last four matches, they only won. Uh, they only got one point actually. So uh, lost against Kiel twice, drew against uh, Kolstad, and lost against Kolstad. Victor, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe they, they are not in their best moment, but how many times have we seen, especially German teams, being number five in the group, number four, number six sometimes, and then in the in the clunch time, uh, they get all the gun, all the big guns out and, <laughs> and, and, and they go back, you know? So I think Paris, yeah, maybe it's not in their best uh, moment and they are having uh, problems, but they are still there you know they are they have same points as uh, Kolstad, only three points uh after kielce and, and olborg which is not too much uh so i i still think that they are not my number three now in the hot ranking <laughs> but uh but i still think they can make it to the final four 
Yeah, well, uh, eventually, they, once they get through the group, uh, they are always able to beat each and every opponent um, in, in a single game or over the stretch of two games. So, uh, yeah, they got to get through because if we do look at the table, yeah, you said it. It's just uh, one point or uh, no, uh, three points behind Kielce. But it's only one point ahead of Zagreb, and Zagreb are in the seventh spot right now. So uh, everyone in Group A still has to look out, because one out of uh, that bunch of uh, of four teams, Costa, PSG, Seged, and Zagreb, isn't going to make it to the to the playoffs round. Uh, playoff round. Um, and yeah, I I find it quite interesting that we have to talk about Paris being in that group. I always like to go to look up because if you look down, you will end up uh, getting yeah. chased, yeah. you know? So if you look up, okay, maybe you're going to work your ass off a little more and try to, to get the, those teams that are up there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, it will be interesting. That's uh, that's for sure. And we might just take that to switch over to the current Machine Seeker EHF Champions League men because it is uh, time for the pen ultimate no for the for the last match die actually already uh, in this year um next week or for you guys this week. But uh, before that, we got to talk about what happened last week. And uh, PSG, in a very, very thrilling match, lost it 26 to 24 uh, against Kiel. Mm, we have to, I have to, when you're speaking about this match, I also have to encourage people to go and look at the Home of Handball Instagram story because we spoke about Elias Skibagutu. And if you want to see a great goal, then uh, go look at some of the top five goals from. Uh, from November because uh, yeah he made one hell of a goal but uh, yeah looking at the statistics you see that um, the French guy Samir he uh, yeah he brought his curtains with him if you can say that in English it's uh, maybe a Danish saying uh, <laughs> but uh, he kind of blocked a lot of uh, a lot of shots and uh, had a lot of saves and you can see that by only conceding 24 goals um, and he have made an impact it's not the first time that we're mentioning his name and you know, uh, I think it was you, Bank, may maybe saying it. He plays with a lot of uh, character as well, and uh, whenever he saves a ball, you know, he's he's showing his uh, happiness about it. But uh, yeah, I look at the statistic now and I see 17 saves. That's a lot, and uh, standing with almost 50 percent in a Champions yeah. League match. Uh, yeah, then you uh, you are up there, and uh, I have to say, if Kiel is not winning whenever your goalkeeper is 50 percent, then uh, you have to look at something else. Uh, so definitely uh, a player that made an impact on the game. Yeah, the the almost 50% impressed me even more than those 17 saves. Uh, those are just ridiculous numbers. And uh, he really held the, the victory for Kiel, even though he didn't finish the match. It was uh, Tomasz Mekra coming in for the, for the last minutes. And uh, I mean... It was the the right choice by Philip Jicher because yeah. uh, he ended up uh, having three saves in a row in the crunch time, uh, and to give Kiel that three nil run. But that was a super brave choice because I don't know whether I would have taken Belasen off after that match. Yeah, it's always a difficult choice. It's always a difficult choice when a goalkeeper has been so hot during the, the whole game, but then in the final minutes, uh, it's been three, four minutes who, who you know, where, where it's not being saving that many uh, balls or, or chances, then it's, it's tough, you know. Sometimes when the coaches want to change something, goalkeepers uh, are always the first ones to, to be changed. And yeah, actually, Markva went out there and he saved three balls. So make a total of 20 balls for, for kill, which is uh, a lot. And, 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 and yeah, it was a right choice. Uh, let's give this one to, to Philip because if he would have been uh, wrong, uh, we would have been saying, oh, but why the hell is he changing, you know? But uh, yeah, let's let's. He knows uh, better than anyone his uh, his players. One of the best left backs of all time. 
yeah, my yeah. number three. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but we also have so... to have in mind, maybe it's a little bit early. Yeah, sorry, Victor. But looking at the, uh, you said it, the next week, uh, Paris are going to Denmark to face against Olbo, who looks very strong at the moment. And uh, Sakre are uh, playing against Pelister. So if Sakre wins that one, then, you know, you're going on the winter break where yeah. Sakre are above you, second playing against Kelsch at home. So we can have a scenario when it look, where it looks like Seket can be above them and Sakharev as well. And then, yeah, nobody would have predicted that, but okay, the season is, is still long. There are four, five games to play, um, but uh, yeah, they have to... I'm surprised about it because earlier we spoke a lot about Kiel, them not, you know, functioning well in the Bundesliga in Germany, but delivering in the, in the, in the EHF Champions League. But uh, Paris Saint-Germain, uh, they sh have to be careful. But uh, it's interesting because normally you would just say that Pelister and Sakharov are the two teams who's not going through from, uh, from that group. But that Sakharov are doing some, uh, I wouldn't say crazy stuff because they're playing very, very well. But uh, yeah, they're shaking it up a little bit for our predictions. Let's, let's, make, let's make a prediction for of that game, All Work Paris. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Um... <laughs> I'm going. I'm going for Paris. I think Paris is going to win. Okay, hey, because I watched yeah. Olbo tonight as well, playing in the Danish league, and uh, yeah, they won. I don't know, with seven, eight goals. Uh, Miguel Hansen played very well in the first half, uh, and I have to say, you know, Lendin also the last round against Kolstad. Uh, to me, he's just making a difference, and that's Lendin. Sometimes you can just look at the match; you don't even have to watch it, and then you can see conceded seven goals. Okay, it's Landin. You don't have to say anything. You just know that, okay, it's one of the days with Landin. Uh, yeah, I think Olbo is playing very well at the moment and looking strong. And it's a boring, but I'm going to say Olbo. Uh, I don't even think that that's the boring choice. Uh, I don't really see someone being super favorized uh, in, in that match. So uh, it can absolutely go into each and every direction. But uh, if we go in for, for predictions, then uh, let's give three tips everyone uh, let's give three predictions um the the winner the margin by what they they win and uh, the uh, uh. top goal scorer of that match let's uh, predict mm. those three things um yeah i am okay. gonna go with uh, alborg plus one and uh, you guys gotta uh, go with your uh, your predictions for for the the winning difference um, um, I'm gonna say that they gonna win with three goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was about to say Paris plus two, mm -hmm. and my top scorer of the game uh, will be uh, Elohim Prandi. That's a nice choice. That's yeah. a nice choice. I think I am going to go with Mikkel Hansen. Uh, now that I uh, called him my number two top left back of all time, conquering for the top spot, uh, and now he's playing yet again against uh, Nikola Karabatic, uh, one of the many, many big fights that these two giants of the game have ever played against each other. Uh, I think Mikkel Hansen is going to score seven goals and will be the top scorer of the game. I have to agree with you, Bengt. Uh, Mikkel Hansen playing against his former team in Denmark, in Olborg. I think he's going to be motivated. Penalty shoots, uh, also making a count here. So Mikkel Hansen is going to be top scorer. Olborg is winning 32 to 29. And yeah, Mikkel Hansen is yeah, scoring a lot of goals. He's actually the only player uh, to be on fire, even with ice in his veins. I'm quite uh, waiting for you, Bengt, asking me for one particular game this week because you have been for three weeks <laughs> telling me, telling me, oh, we will wait, we will wait, we will wait, and then what happened? But I'm waiting for you to ask me for one particular game this week. As soon as I saw the result, I was like, yeah, okay, we're going to speak about that one, of course. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, ah, yeah, right. Uh, Geo Geo against Porto. Yeah. What happened there? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it was payback time for Barca. And it was uh, DKMM taking over, stepping up uh, for the victory uh, 10 seconds prior to the, to the final whistle. And with the block, with the block to, to keep the, the lead. I think that it was a top, top game from all the team. I think they 
were really really consistent in defense which was uh the, the the worst that they have done in the in the game in Barcelona and of course Dikamem was superb but Gonzalo Pérez de Vargas was superb not because of the number of saves because he saved nine balls uh, he played only in the second half but the moment the moment of the saves it was uh, crazy and especially after the you know the the season where where he is not being uh, the the main actor in the goal of Barcelona, uh, so he made his impact in the game, and also I would like to say one name that it it was amazing in my opinion, Karlsborgard game, it was crazy. It was so consistent. It was uh, in defense in number three, and then in attack during the whole second half. Uh, where we are normally uh, seeing Engesan playing there, uh, especially in attack. It was Karlsbogart playing in attack during the whole second half, and he made an amazing game. Yeah, absolutely, especially when I saw the numbers that Perez de Vargas uh, put on, on the, the sheet uh, in the end. It was just uh, amazing, and uh, he really came back without uh, without ever having a doubt that uh, he will still fight for the top spot at Barca, no matter what happens with Emil Nielsen. Emil Nielsen could have a, a game where he saves 70% and Perez de Vargas would want to play the next game. And uh, that's uh, quite impressive about him, that he uh, really performs whenever he, he is needed. Um, but maybe talking about uh, Gonzalo Perez de Vargas, how would you describe his situation right now, Victor? Well, his situation is tough, you know, uh, his situation is tough because it's a player who always wants to, to play and everybody knows he's going to go to Kiel in 2025. And, 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 but still, he has a lot to give to Barcelona because uh, uh, he is a guy who, who, who has grown in Barcelona, who has Barcelona colors very, he feels, who feels Barcelona colors very deep inside. And, and his situation is complicated because he's not playing as much as he wanted, but it's just because Emil Nielsen is playing amazing during the whole uh, Champions League games. So I think that he is adapting to, to his uh, role at this moment at the team. He is helping uh, the best possible way. And, and I think he is a team player uh, that is giving his best in every training because I, I know him as a person. Everybody knows that we are close friends. Uh, I know him and, and I'm, I'm not sure. I know he's giving his best in every training and not only as a player, but only as a captain without the armband. You know, uh, he's not wearing it, but he is still a captain inside that locker room. Just a leader. A leader of the yep. of the team and uh, taking in that role, taking in the responsibilities, but uh, going ahead with the with his performances, uh, you really have to give that to him. It's uh, absolutely remarkable. He's he's a character, but he's also a kind of goalkeeper that uh, has the same thing about him. Like for example, Landin and Omeye had. Then whenever he has the day, he has a character. This that it looks like people are sometimes a little bit afraid of shooting at him because they know that he's just gonna save it. And uh, yeah, Perez de Vaga is uh, yeah, unbelievable goalkeeper and is yeah. It's great to see that he got the chance to show that one. But also, as Victor said, it was a great game. And you could see throughout the, the game that uh, then West Ham was leading with one, two goals. Barcelona with two, three goals. It was a pretty tight and even game throughout, you know, 60 minutes. And uh, But in the end, we also saw it with the result that DKMM scored. And then they won with one goal. Crucial win, because I'm also looking at the games coming up for uh, for Barcelona. I, um and they have Celia, Gilgi, Porto, Montpellier, and then they play away against Magdeburg, uh, which is a tough one. But this one will might, uh, I still see them as favorites in Germany against Magdeburg. This one will probably give them the first spot in, in, in the group. And that's set with five games before, but I don't see them losing to Celia, Porto or Gilgi, for example. Um, and yeah, it's dangerous to say, but... Uh, Important win for Barcelona, uh, and uh, yeah, and a very nice game for whoever loves handball. You know, to to watch this one. 
I would. I think it was. Uh, sorry, Bank. I think it was one of the best humble games. Uh, I have seen in the last uh, years, I would say it was, it was so tough, so fast. Uh, the, the the contacts in defense, you could feel the toughness from the TV, and 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 it. But it, at the same, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, it was clean. It was a clean game, you know. Uh, the referees they didn't have many many uh, you know problems to to referee that game because it was a a, a fair uh, uh, you know a fair game so I think it was an amazing humble game to watch. Yeah, totally, and uh, I would absolutely say that this was the best game that we have seen this season so far. So uh, we can uh, absolutely agree on that because it's uh, been, I think, six times that the lead switched back and forth, and uh, Barca took it just in the very, very last minute. Um, and yeah, it was just uh, very, very thrilling to see. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, and you can absolutely feel the intensity of that match by uh, listening to the interviews after the game because uh, I love the way that Carlos Ortega stood in front of the camera and said, uh, yeah, well, we were able to, to stop that Vesprem attack. They still scored 30 goals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you compare with the 41 goals that they scored in Palau Laurana, yes, they were able to, to stop them. Yeah, yeah, totally. But uh, it does say a lot about that Vesprem offense as well when uh, they scored 30 goals. Um, but that was the number where uh, Barca managed to stop them. Yeah, but Humble, the way it's played, the way it's played today, yeah, I would exactly. say 30 goals. It's not a high uh, scoring. Yeah, exactly. I was about to say the game also changed and and also. Barcelona is a team that want to play, you know, counter attacks themselves and get the easy goals um, with the wings and everyone pushing. But it's also a hard find balance to still be able to control the game. So it's not getting out of hand and, you know, just being from running from one end to the other. Uh, and um, yeah, Barcelona are great at doing that, you know, putting pressure and pushing the tempo up. But as Victor said, the game has developed. Also with the fast middle, whenever people scores, they throw a hard ball up to the middle and they can run. Uh, so yeah, um, but uh, it is interesting, as you said, Bank, that uh, uh, having in mind that uh, 30 goals is, is actually controlling the other team a little bit uh, better than normally. Um, but it's also a game where you have probably some of the best players in the world playing against each other uh, in each position. So uh, of course, we're going to you know, see some spectacular goals and high scoring game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was thinking about uh, if you, if you guys, the two of you would have to give the MVP award of this round to, to one player. So not just of the match of the week, but of this mm -hmm. whole match day, who would it be? And it's such a tough choice. It's such a tough decision. Um, I ended up uh, giving it to uh, to Sami Belasen uh, because just the yeah. way that he led throughout the the whole game. But then on the other hand, um, especially with what you said, Martin, uh, that this game it just gave the the group victory to Barca. We don't have to discuss too much yeah. about that. Um, and Dika Mem scoring the last goal and blocking the last shot, those were. 10 very, very important seconds that Dika Mem had, and he would be a reasonable choice as well. But uh, yeah, I ended up uh, giving it to Samir Belasen. Waiting for you, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I was thinking about uh, Samir as well, because, you know, the impact he had on the result. And yeah, you said it, Pink. Uh, I don't know why I thought about just giving it to the whole soccer team because if they have lost against Seket, then they probably would have been yeah ruling out of the group in general. And uh, oh, if I have to think about one player standing out, you know, you could also say Landin, but is I'm gonna put pressure on you, uh, Victor, because the big players they step up at big moment. Then I say Dikamem. <laughs> uh... You then say Kalsbogard, maybe. Say, no, Kalsbogard, he, he could, could be, but if we are talking about the moment, the moment to appear in the game, I would say Gonzalo, Gonzalo Pérez de Vargas. Okay. I think 
this uh, save to Remy Lee in the fast break second half that uh, it's been one of the best save of the of the round it's uh, a yeah. key save to to keep Barca in the game because I think it was a save for best Prem to to put themselves two goals up uh, the momentum. so yeah the momentum it's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it was uh, very very uh, important for for the team yeah but uh, there were very many big names and there are three or four more that could have been thrown into the ring but i like the choices actually uh, i i like it a lot um and you can really feel the uh, the necessity of, of goalkeepers and because uh, two of those three names were were goalies and uh, you put yeah. Landine in there as well so uh, it was goalkeepers week I would uh, say it like it, that yeah I agree actually but it's not because Tikamem probably played his best game but you said it yourself you know the last 10 seconds uh, showing up there is it's, it's it's one of the main reasons why I probably could choose him but I have to give a shout out to the Sakharov team uh, because they are making sure to stay uh, you know um, in a ha, in a ha, good position ha, ha. stay alive stay alive <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, they're making themselves you know looking really great and they're playing as a team and uh, before it was more like you know Zagreb we didn't you know really rely and count on them but and they are in a tough group we have to remember that as well so uh, it's gonna uh, let's keep an eye on what they can do in the upcoming rounds and the next round as well if they end up kicking Paris Saint-Germain out of the Champions League, I'm leaving, boys. I'm, I'm just out of here. I'm going to Bolivia. I can't take that anymore. <laughs> but yeah, it, uh... yeah, but I would even say that if they're going to end up taking the spot from pick second, I would say that it's a little bit of a surprise as well. Totally. Yeah, even though they were really close to making it, you know, uh, Porto, I think it was Porto last year who took the spot fr uh, from them in the last round. But even them, you know, taking the spot from pick second would be a, a big surprise to me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, the the upcoming weeks will give us answers. I am very much looking forward to that uh, Alborg against PSG game. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, Alborg, but I think we are just gonna keep that for next week uh, because uh, it will be it will be intense what will be played there. And uh, yeah, then we do have uh, some more teams to look out for. Um, we haven't talked about Magdeburg in a while, but they are really on a streak and uh, they do deserve their shout out, mm. uh, especially after that start into the Machine Seeker Edge of Champions League season um, yeah. with those two losses against uh, Vesprem and, uh, and Barca. One already tempted to say, oh, well, are the, the champions struggling? But then uh, they just came back to full strength. And the really beautiful thing about it is that uh, they are on level terms with Vesprem right now. And that will be the decisive game at the very last uh, match day of the group stage. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to it and hope that they will still be on level terms. Yeah, exactly. Because I was about to say they have uh, Porto, Vizsla Plotch and uh, Celia, I think. And I expect them to win those three matches. And then they will play against Barcelona, yeah. which uh, I have Barcelona as well. But as you said, they, the last match is in Hungary against Vesprem. And uh, even when we have Fabregas, as I guess he said it as well, that was a crucial win for Vesprem to win in Magdeburg and also for him personally to go to Germany and win against the champs. But uh, yeah, they're going to win probably the next three matches and then uh, they are in the race for a spot in top two. But uh, I'm going to keep my Barcelona Vesprem prediction there. And I mean, uh, if they end up winning the next three matches, they will be on a 10 game winning streak that is huge yeah. but then they have two games yeah. left against the two teams they didn't beat yet yeah. victor and froze nice to have you back <laughs> <laughs> oh man this country they don't have a good wi-fi anywhere you know? <laughs> great uh, unofficially yeah, yeah, one yeah, of the best wi-fi's <laughs> Yeah, I think Magdeburg is uh, it's in the probably best moment of the season. Maybe maybe now, uh, yeah, let's see how they finish the Bundesliga because Bundesliga is going so long uh, into Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but I think that this moment where when they were to the to the Super Globe and they uh, raised the, the trophy there and when they came back, it was the best moment for them, especially at the beginning when they were struggling a little bit uh, with the results in, in Champions League. Um, but as we know, and, and Magdeburg is a very, very deep roster. They have a lot of players in, uh, in, in, in all the positions who can deliver in Bundesliga, in Champions League, and who can win games. And still, we have Christiansen missing. Mm -hmm. That was probably, uh, arguably, the best to... player of the team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, Magdeburg is uh, uh, again uh, a very serious contender, but they will have to win against Barcelona home to be able to arrive with the same points in Hungary than Besprem. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. So that's going to be interesting. But yeah, I was uh, just about to to talk about that as well. That uh, I I wanted to say I will just throw in a name here that uh, almost got forgotten over the uh, the past few months, uh, but uh, brings nightmares back to the Kielces of this world. Brings nightmares back to the Barces of this world. It's Gisli Christiansen because uh, his comeback is getting closer. It was a, a tough injury on his shoulder and uh, we will see how he will come back. But uh, those decisive matches, we shall not forget that they are end of February and beginning of March. That's a lot of time to recover and uh, to, to get back to his, uh, his old form. Uh, it's still like three months to go and I do hope that we will see Gisli back on the court very soon. Uh, in a very good shape because then I can even see Magdeburg taking points away from Barca. That's one prediction that you're going to stand alone with the uh, bank, but of course it's going to be a nice match. Me and against the rest of the world. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's truly, you're living the dream with the Captain America's weather and the predictions. <laughs> it's going along. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but as Victor said, they have to, you know, compete against Barcelona. And once they did that, we also have to remind ourselves that the Vespen won with five goals in Magdeburg. That's also something to say there. Uh, but yeah, for sure, Gisli Kutzer and again, yeah, adding him to a squad is obviously giving them, them another, um, uh, what can you say? Yeah, just another quality player in a, in a deep roster, as, as Victor said. And uh, the way that he plays one versus one, uh, yeah, that's going to be dangerous for everyone. Um, sometimes, speaking about, you know, taking three steps and a little bit more, uh, but uh, in general, he's an amazing player and we saw what he's capable of doing in the, in the Champions League final, even with a, a shoulder that was like that. He he played bowling and he still won. That's just yeah. insane because he couldn't lift his arm above uh, like that spot and he, he couldn't lift it higher than uh, his shoulder and he still managed to to score and score and score and uh, I will really never forget that moment when. Uh, uh, actually, we were just uh, sitting in the truck uh, when the final four, uh, when the truck got 24, EHF final four was happening, and then someone just texted into the chat, um, "Guys, Gisli is warming up," and then uh, he uh, was uh, subbed in like 20 minutes into the game, and just the the whole hall stood up, uh, gave standing ovations, and uh, the whole of Cologne just shouted, "Gisli!" Gisli, <laughs> that was just uh, that was massive. That was uh, one of. Uh, but you know, yeah. Sometimes uh, you know people from Iceland they have a tendency to just you know forget about their pain and they are true fighters. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, they. I don't know how they do it sometimes, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, unbelievable. And that's a moment to remember. But uh, the you rest... can also see the reactions after what it meant to them and what yeah, they have to sacrifice. Totally. And Victor knows itself. It's not just about one match and what you have to go through. It's also the amount of, yeah, efforts just to be there. And also the semi-final against Barcelona with Mike Jensen coming in and saving, you know, penalty shots and them missing. So uh, yeah, that's oh. a tournament that we're gonna remember for a long, long time. 
but I can see a little tear running down Victor's left uh, left cheek. So mm -hmm. I think we got to cut it right here uh, because all of that uh, Gizli future talk is a look into the into the crystal ball. But for now, the the standings do heat up a lot, and I really like it. It's getting intense, and it's getting really, really, uh, yeah, well, exciting. Um, Or to put it with other words, uh, and that will make you happy once again, Martin. The Avengers are assembled, and I uh, am looking forward to the upcoming weeks. It is the last match day of this year's Machine Seeker EHF Champions League. So, uh, yeah, my call uh, out to everyone is just go and enjoy it, because uh, it will only come back after the, walk, uh, after the, the Euros. And there are some interesting matches as well. You know, we had it this round as well with the matchups. I think we have Montpellier against GOG as well. Sikit Kelsche, Olbo against Paris, uh, Kiel. If I have to look here as well, they're playing against Kolstad, Sagosen coming back. Uh, yeah, there are interesting matches. So um, it's just be ready and uh, because we will analyze them as well. That's it. And that's uh, where I would say... Victor, go ahead and enjoy the, the last bits of snow that you will see for the, for the next 365 <laughs> days. Uh, but, They're actually uh, saying there's coming a lot of snow tomorrow, Victor, so be careful. Is Is it? It? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When we say I a lot it. in Denmark, it's around 10 to 15 centimeters of snow. So. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, oh my I, god! Yeah. Oh yeah, I can I can actually just see it in the reflection of uh, his eyes. Victor is just uh, online shopping a sleigh. He uh, <laughs> wants to go and ride downhill. <laughs> actually, I'm going to send you a picture next week uh, in our WhatsApp group about where am I, and that will okay. be close to Barcelona. Oh yeah, well then uh, Ooh, okay. I am I am keen, uh, but uh, it will probably okay. have something to do with the snow as well, uh, since you uh, teased us into that direction once in a while or uh, in a while already, boys. Enjoy your Saturday evening and uh, to all the listeners out there, thank you guys for tuning in once again and uh, the, the upcoming week will be an intense one. So go ahead, watch handball and we will hear each other again next week when it's time to talk handball again. Ball across to Dylan Nahi, double in flight. Oh, what a start. Ooh, into the net. Keep up it again. Yes. Oh, the shot.